Good morning. It's a joy again to be with you all, to be able to uh, not just get into God's word, which is always a blessing, but to be with God's people and the fellowship that we have. I was trying to explain to my uh, son, Zachary, yesterday, we were sitting down at lunch and enjoying just getting to meet, for him, a lot of new people. And uh, he's trying to make all the connections because some people will say, this is your cousin or this is your uncle. And he was feeling somewhat overwhelmed. And I just said, Zachary, listen, if it's someone around your age, let's just call them your cousin. If it's someone a little older, just refer to them as uncle or auntie. And if it's someone with gray hair, they're an umachi or upacha. <laughs> he looked at me, said, that means we have a big family here. And I said, that's about right. But it's been a joy. It's been really good for us to be able to enjoy this uh, ministry of God's word with you, but to be also to get, enjoy the fellowship of it, to, to live it out in community as well. And that's what this passage really is all about. And so I encourage you to turn in your Bibles again to Ephesians chapter 5. As we continue this look of what it means to walk A walk that's worthy, and that's what we heard the first night with our dear brother as he encouraged us to look at this heavenly walk that we are called to. And then yesterday morning, I was encouraging us to remember how we should not walk, how we need to put aside that old self and recognize the new new identity we've been given in Christ and to walk in that. Well, Paul continues his admonition of walking, but now and again in a positive sense of how we are to walk in love and what that looks like. So he starts off there in chapter five and verse one, he says, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you, as is proper among the saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and his God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them. Walk in love. And sure enough, this idea that we're going to get into this morning, this idea of what it means not just to walk, but to walk in love, is the main idea that Paul has here. And sure enough, both within our culture and really within our churches and communities, we have a lot of different interpretations of what love is. A number of years ago, I was attending a meeting at a church. It was during the Lord's Supper. It's, it was the first meeting, and sure enough, if you are part of churches that have a, a remembrance meeting, a Lord's Supper, you know that it's usually a more solemn event, usually a little quieter, more, a little more subdued. And if you're a family with young children, you know how difficult it can be at times to keep those children a little more quiet. Well, sure enough, there was a young family there in the meeting, a father who was trying to keep his son quiet, and this son was not having it. He was fidgeting, he was talking, he was being out of turn, and after encouragement, encouragement, the father could not get him to be quiet. Well, finally, the father picked up his son and started walking to the back door. And in the middle of this quiet, solemn meeting, as the son was being carried out, he yelled out for all to hear, somebody please help! My dad's going to show me his love! (laughs) And we knew exactly what that meant, right? We knew what type of love he was going to see, but apparently he had experienced that love many times before. Every time he was administered discipline, the father probably said to him, I'm doing this because I love you. And he knew that love was coming. (laughs) To be sure, we have a lot of different interpretations of what love is in our culture. And I 
I want to encourage us, before we get into the details of this passage, maybe to challenge us to re-examine how perhaps we as Christians have defined this word love. More often than not, the way that we think of love, we think that love is simply an action. Love is something you do to another person. It's, sh- it's how you show love is by some type of behavior, some type of activity. But one of the things I want scripture to challenge us is to understand that sc- through scripture, love is communicated both as an emotion and an action. To be sure, there is behavior involved in love, but I think we need to be challenged by Scripture to understand it is not just merely action. It is both affection that drives the action. In fact, a lot of us have heard this comparison between these two Greek words in the New Testament that describe the word love. On one side, we have this word called agape, we, we usually define it as sacrificial love, this love that is willing to spend anything for the one in whom it's love. And we often attribute this to God, to Jesus, and is encouraged amongst his saints. And then we have this other word called filio. It's so often translated as brotherly love, hence the name of a famous city, Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. And we say that's kind of more friendship. That's more side-by-side kind of love between friends. And we often play these words off against each other. We say filio is good, but we should aspire for agape. Agape is godly. And in some cases, that is true. But the reality of the situation, in fact, in the writings of the New Testament and in ancient Greek culture, the word agape was used for both wonderful, sacrificial love and love that was Evil. In fact, agape can be a wrong type of love. There were people in the ancient Greek culture that agaped wine. They would sell everything to get wine because they loved wine so much. But we would be very clear in understanding that's not godly love, but nevertheless, the word was used in culture. And in some cases, we have to understand, lest we think agape is just some behavior, agape is also an affection, and an affection that can be in the wrong direction. And we need to let scripture inform the way we think about this. In fact, one of the ways in which we need to think about this is realizing that love, generally speaking, is an attraction towards an object, an individual, but it can be a thing as well. This reality that there is some type of emotional response towards something. This attraction is usually the result of seeing some quality in an object, some type of good or value or desire when we think of that. I have a student of mine who who recently purchased a new car and the first day they came into my class and they said, Mr. Matthew, you got to see this thing. This thing is beautiful. I said, I can't go right now. I said, like, don't worry. I've got it on my phone. I've got pictures right here. And they started to flip through their pictures on the phone. This is the back of the car. This is the front of the car. This is the inside of a car. These are the wheels of the car. I'm like, I've seen a car before, right? The, their attraction, their emotions were heightened because of their value they placed on that car. And so we need to appreciate that, yes, love is an action, but love is usually an emotional response as we think through an evaluation of something. I love that. I love them. And so we behave in conjunction with that thought. Unless you think this is a definition that I'm just trying to make up myself, I would argue that Scripture talks about this in many, many ways. First off, in the Gospels, we see the triune God himself engaging in this affection and action of love. We see the Father who loves the Son. You remember those moments when we would hear the voice of the Father? This is my beloved Son. Hear him. In fact, we see the example of love in Jesus' own life. Remember the story where he gets word that you who you love, Lazarus, is sick. 
And Jesus loved Lazarus and his sisters. And we see how that love is played out even through the suffering and death of his friend. But make no mistake, Jesus loved people. And sure enough, the encouragement for us as his ambassadors to love God and to love others, the greatest commandment we can have in this life. But in fact, understand, our love too can be misplaced. Our love can go in the wrong direction. Jesus himself says in Matthew chapter 6, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate one and love the other. Do you hear those two references here? If you were to ask most people, how do they define the word hate? Understand, most people would say, oh, it's a strong affection of disdain. But make no mistake, we would define it as an emotion. When you hate something, you feel something. Well, I think that's Jesus' whole point. He's trying to say, either you have an emotion of hate or you can have an emotion of love. You can't have both at the same time. That's what he's saying here in terms of you can't serve two masters. He's using these two emotional qualities to qualify this command of following God. Emotion most definitely is part of what love is. Paul will talk about this in his writings quite often. He talks about how God demonstrates his love for us. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God, the Father who loved us, the love that is in Christ Jesus, how one of the fruit of the Spirit is love. And sure enough, Paul, if you've ever been to a wedding before, one of the most common passages that's read is 1 Corinthians 13, is it not? This wonderful passage describing love. It's a great opportunity to, to encourage and witness to others what love is all about. But I can't, can I tell you how many times I've heard that read or read it myself? And I think I missed a lot of what was communicated there. Because most of my life I was taught that love is what you do. But then Paul actually addresses that in his writings. Look what he says. If I give away all I have, that's a pretty good action, wouldn't you say? That's a pretty good behavior. Well, he takes it a step further. If I deliver up my body to be burned, wow, what a wonderful behavior. What a wonderful action. That's got to be love, right? But look what he says. If I give all I have, if I deliver my body to be burned, but I have not love, it profits me nothing. You can give every dime you have away. You can do all the right behaviors, but if you don't have the right affections behind the behaviors, according to the Apostle Paul, it's nothing. It's nothing. And sure enough, we see this played out time and time in Scripture, even in the epistles themselves and the last book of Revelation. The writer of Hebrews will encourage, let brotherly love continue. James will say that he has promised to those who love him great and wonderful things. Peter will say to love from a pure heart, to challenge ourselves that way. And even Jude will say, we'll ask that mercy and peace and love to be multiplied. In fact, in the last letter, Sorry, in the last uh, writings in the book of Revelation, as Jesus has penned these letters to the seven churches, he writes one to the church at Ephesus. And he reiterates this point, interestingly enough, as we're in the book of Ephesians. In Ephesus, they were doing a lot of right behaviors. A lot of good works, toil. They had patient endurance. They were doing a lot of the right behaviors. But Jesus says, I have one thing against you. You have lost your first love. The Ephesian believers, they could do all the right behaviors, but if they don't have the right affections, they will be challenged by the Lord Jesus himself. How much more we do we need to hear this today? That it is not just about doing the right actions, but it's also having the right affections behind the actions. That we need to have both. And so love for the New Testament believer for us today is the same. Love is based on knowledge, knowledge of who he is 
as revealed to us in his word. So love is not just some random experience that we have. No, no. Love is based on truth and truth is in Jesus Christ. But sure enough, love also is an emotion. Paul will say you can do all the right actions, but you need something behind it. And to be sure, love also is an action that God demonstrates his love. I would encourage us, it's both a cognitive, it's, it's a heart attitude, and it, it, it's an action. This is what I tell my students, that our life is to be involved in our head, in our heart, and in our hands. He wants it all. And that's what love is defined as. We need to challenge ourselves, just as Jesus did to his, his wonderful disciple. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And Peter had to realize that, yes, love is what he does, but it's also in his affection as well. We often think that love is just an action, a a duty we need to perform to other people. May I encourage us to realize that actually does not honor God if we have no real love behind our action. In fact, I realize if I did this with others, if I did this with my wife, what, what a terrible thing that would actually be. Imagine, imagine one day I come home from work and I, I decide to surprise my wife with some flowers. No reason, no occasion. I just want to show her my love. And I stop at the floral shop and I get some flowers. I come into the house with my hand behind my back as I walk into the kitchen and I present them to her and I say, here you go. And she looks at them and thinks, oh, they're beautiful. Why did you get me these flowers? And I simply respond with my hand up and I say, well, it's my duty. Now, at this point, a lot of the men are like, and what? That's not, that's not good? Or all you ladies should be getting quite upset at that, right? If my answer for why I gave my wife flowers is because it's my duty, it's the right behavior, it's the right action, my wife will not be pleased. And she shouldn't be. If all I'm doing in these actions is because I have to and there's no emotion behind the action, may I argue that is not just a bad thing for me, that actually is not honoring her. What if I rewind that situation and instead I I come back and I buy the flowers and I come into the kitchen and I say, here you go, and she looks at them and says, oh, they're beautiful, why did you get them? And I say to her, because I love you. Oh, she'd be much happier then, wouldn't she? And in fact, if you were to observe that little interaction between us, you would then surmise, apparently he thinks very highly of this woman, that not just that he gets her flowers, but the reason why he gets the flowers and motivates him. God wants both. He wants our love to be defined not just by what we do, but how we feel. And that feeling, that emotion is based on truth on who Jesus Christ is. And so sure enough, when the Apostle Paul then encourages us here in Ephesians chapter five, he encourages us to walk in love. We've been given a reminder of what the whole idea of Ephesians is. Our brother on the first night encouraged us to remember Ephesians is divided up in two areas, right? This first doctrinal or theological idea of the unity that we have both in Christ and now with each other. And how that has come and born to us through the reconciling work of God. And then in the last chapters, he wants to be more practical. He wants to give us some application of those truths in the first chapter. The unity of the church in in diversity and, and how we live that truth out. And sure enough, in this passage before us this morning, we see again this example of our identity being shown to us. Who we are in Christ informs our walk with Christ. To avoid sins of sexuality and to avoid sins of speech and as such to motivate us, even with some warnings. So take a look again there with what the apostle says in in verse 1 there of Ephesians 5. Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. I had a professor of mine who often said, whenever you see a therefore, find out what the therefore is there for. 
Whenever you see a therefore, find out what the therefore is there for. It's intended to give you a little mental cue to take a look right before that therefore. He's trying to refer to what he just said to make his next point. And sure enough, when we look at the therefore and we look what was there before the therefore, we see in chapter four what we talked about yesterday. This encouragement to speak truth, to use righteous anger, to share with each other, to speak encouragement, to be kind, tender hearted, remembering that to forgive each other as God forgave you. Paul is looking back to all of that and encouraging us to remember where we are. If you remember yesterday morning, we talked about how it doesn't fit anymore to live like a Gentile. And for those of you that were here, I actually brought out a jacket that didn't fit anymore. And again, my excuse is the jacket shrunk and let's just go with that, right? But the reality is I took that jacket off and I laid it down. And the word that we often find for that in in culture is mortification, the idea of killing our old self. After the meeting was done and I was heading over to lunch, a a dear sister was teasing me because I was still carrying the jacket. And she looked at me and said, you told us to kill that jacket. (laughs) I said, yeah, but I might need it for another illustration in the future. (laughs) But she was right. We need to kill the old self. We need to kill the old self so we can put on the new. And in fact, this is what he says, therefore be imitators of God. To be an imitator of God, a God who is holy. So he calls us to be holy just as he is. A God who loves to love. And so he calls you and I to love not just those who are lovable. In fact, even your enemies, because that's what our father did. He loved And so he calls us to be like his father. But I love that way he says it is to be imitators of God. We talked about this yesterday morning, how we are created in the image of God. From the very beginning of Genesis, we saw that truth. But sure enough, sin entered into our story and and damaged that image. Now, mind you, the image is not gone, but it has been marred through sin. And this is the redemptive work of Christ, is to bring us back to himself, to restore that image in his glory, in his children. That we are his image, as he talks many times within his writings. But the encouragement is to do this because of this. To imitate God because we are his children. In fact, if you remember, if you've read through Ephesians, you know that Paul talked about this earlier in his writings. In chapter 1, in verse 5, he said, beloved, that we are now adopted. We've been brought into his family. We were once outside, but through the process of adoption, we've been brought into his community. I have a a, a good friend of mine. His name's Ernie. Ernie was raised in in the Philippines, and he was adopted by some wonderful Christians who were missionaries there. An American couple who spent many years, decades, serving in the Philippines decided to adopt this young Filipino boy named Ernie and bring them into his house. Well, interestingly enough, the other kids in the family, who were all older than Ernie, were were blonde hair, were blue-eyed, and looked like their parents, whereas Ernie, being from the Philippines, had dark hair, had dark eyes, and some darker skin. And his his siblings would often tease him, saying, well, you don't really look like us. You, You don't really match us. And early on, Ernie came up with a good response where he said, yeah, you gotta understand, though, Mom and dad, they chose me. They're stuck with you. (laughs) They chose him. And that's what God did with us. But make no mistake, Ernie is one of their children. Maybe not biological, but to be sure in every sense of the word. They are now, we are now part of his family. I do this often with my kids, times when I need to leave the house and I have to leave my, life, my wife alone with four young children. A lot of times I'll grab my sons and I'll, before I head out the door, I give them some encouragement. We do this thing in our house where we kind of put our hands on top of each other like a team. And I look at my boys and I say, okay, listen, dad has to go for a while, but I need you guys to take care of the house. Take care of mom, take care of your sisters. I need you guys to be Matthew men. And what I mean by that is I'm trying to encourage them that as a Matthew, you have a name to carry. You have a responsibility. 
And as a man, you are now given an opportunity to lead. I want them even at this young age to understand that they're to imitate dad. When I said that one time to my son, Zachary, I want you to be Matthew, man. He quickly retorted, so you're saying I can eat cookies without mom looking? <laughs> no, 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 that's not what I'm saying, but don't tell mom about the cookies. Um, but the reality is we are to imitate our God. We're to look like him. But I love the way Paul lays this out, to be imitators of God as beloved children. My identity informs my activity. Do you see that? We, we come to him, we imitate him because of who we are. We obey because we are loved. We are not loved because we obey. Or as I heard it one said, we don't imitate God to become his children. We imitate God because we are his children. This truth, this imperative to imitate him rests upon the indicative because we are. Your identity has changed as a believer. Now walk in that truth. And this is something we need to hear time and time again. So he encourages us in verse two to walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice. And again, this is a theme of this week, is it not? To walk, not as the Gentiles did, but to walk as children of light and to be careful how you walk. My, my children were envying seeing some people on some golf carts here around the campus. And, and my, my, my child, one of my children asked me, do we get one of those golf carts? And I said, no, 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 those aren't for us. To which one of them says, well, that makes sense. The theme of the conference is walk. <laughs> so sure enough, we're walking. And this is one of the big themes of Paul's writings is to walk, but he encourages us to walk in love. And this word of love, this encouragement of affection and behavior is also riddled within his writings. And the encouragement to walk in love as Christ loved us. If you remember, at the end of chapter four yesterday morning, we were looking at how we are to forgive because God forgave us. And sure enough, Paul kind of continues that idea. Remember, God encourages you to forgive because God forgave us. Well, now you are to love as Christ loved us. Do you see that parallel there? It's a wonderful encouragement to be like God who forgave us and to be like Christ who loved us. And in fact, he who gave himself up for us. The, the most great and wonderful example of love ever given to us. As the, the gospel writer Mark says, even the son of man came not to be served, but to serve. To give his life a ransom for many. This is the example we are given. To be a servant, to sacrifice ourselves for others as the great servant did for us a number of years ago when I was living in Dallas I had the great blessing and honor to study at Dallas Theological Seminary and I remember my first day on campus as I was very excited to start classes there I was also very interested to to look around the campus because I had heard there was a statue there on the camp on the campus grounds there at Dallas Seminary So after orientation was done, I had some free time. I started walking around the campus looking for the statue, and I found it in the center of one of these campuses. The the name of the statue is The Servant, and it was a, a statue made and dedicated to one of the former presidents of Dallas Seminary. It was, a, it was a statue, larger than life, bronze statue of Jesus washing the feet of Peter. You remember that scene in the upper room? where they're, they're having the Last Supper, even arguing who would the greatest be in the kingdom, and all of a sudden, the greatest of the kingdom is washing their feet. And I had heard about this statue, and I found it, and it's huge. It's this beautiful statue, if you've ever seen it. And I remember seeing Peter there. He's kind of seated, and he, he looks big and burly like a fisherman, and he's sitting there, and sure enough, there's a, a, a statue of Jesus washing his feet. And we realized it was just an artist's rendition of it. It wasn't a real image. But I, nevertheless, I wanted to see what Jesus' face looked like. 
Because I remember looking at the statue and the way that Jesus was positioned is he was down on his knees and, and the hair was kind of blocking his face. And so I couldn't quite see his face. And so I started having to, to look down like this. I'm in my jacket and tie, first day of classes and the heat of Dallas's sun. And I'm trying to look at this face of Jesus and I'm having to get even further down to, to be able to see the fee, face of Jesus. And, and I find myself on my knees to see the face of Jesus. And I found myself on my knees to see the face of Jesus. You see, that was the whole point of the artist who made that statue. He wanted anyone who came to see that statue to realize what their true calling was. That if you want to be a servant of Jesus, you got to look like a servant. And if you want to see the face of Jesus, sometimes you got to get down on your knees and serve. That's the calling for us, is it not? Not just in physical posture, but in heart, in, in mind, in action, in everything God is calling us to imitate him. To be like this great servant that came to serve us. And sure enough, he became a fragrant offering and sacrifice. Paul talks about this often. He talks about these ideas from the Old Testament. How in, in, in the Old Testament, the Lord would, would smell these pleasing aromas of sacrifice given to him. Paul will even talk about this in his writings as we see here. In other writings, the encouragement is given to us as his followers. That through us spreads the fragrance of him. You know, an interesting thing about this though. When it comes to this pleasurable smell. Understand, for a pleasurable smell of an offering to be given, there has to be a sacrifice first delivered. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I don't put the two together. I just want to be a pleasing aroma. I don't like this idea so much of the sacrifice before it, though. Just this past month, one of my neighbors behind our house gave us a barbecue grill. It was an old one, and it was a charcoal one, but he wasn't using it anymore, and I've always wanted to try charcoal grill, so he gave it to us, and it's been fun, and my family's been very patient with me as I try to learn the delicacies of charcoal grilling. But sure enough, when I put that meat on there, when I put whatever we're eating, that wonderful smell starts coming off of that grill. But you know, when I put that meat down, I have no sense of loss in regards to that meat. I didn't have to raise that cow. <laughs> I didn't have to feed that cow. I didn't have to butcher that cow. I didn't have to wrap that cow up. There's no real loss. I just went to the supermarket, picked up the nicest look of meat that I could find and put it on the grill. There was no loss for my gain. But to be sure, understand, often if we are to be a pleasing, fragrant offering as Christ was, a pain of sacrifice must come before the pleasure of smell. This is how we are to walk. This is how we are to walk. Well, sure enough, as Paul encourages us of, again what we should do, he encourages us again of what we should not do. But sexual immorality, all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among the saints. As Paul encourages us of how we should walk, he reminds us again of how we should not walk. He says how there should not be any immorality. And the Greek there you can see porneia is where we get the word today of pornography. And so this includes all types of sexual sin, fornication, adultery, homosexuality, bestiality, incest, pedophilia. And we live in a culture today, do we not? Where they are redefining what is moral in terms of sexual areas. But again, God wants more than just proper action. He wants also the motivation of sexual purity. Remember when Jesus said, you've heard it said not to commit adultery, but I say to you, do not even look at a woman with lustful thoughts. See, he doesn't just want proper behavior. He wants proper affections behind the behavior. 
He wants both. He doesn't want any impurity to be amongst us. Anything that is unclean and filthy and was usually associated with sexual sins. Listen, we have to understand that sex is a wonderful blessing given by God, but is to be enjoyed in the covenant of one man and one woman in marriage. God designed it that way. He intends it to be enjoyed that way. And so Paul's encouragement is, why would you go back to all the wrong ways? Sex is not wrong, but sex outside of God's parameters is sinful. He also encourages us to put away all types of greed. And this could be sexual greed or greed in general. But the the reality is it's moving again from the affections of the heart to the behaviors of their body. And the encouragement here is that not even any of these to be named among you. Why? Because it's not proper among the saints. The saints. He encourages us not just to avoid the action, but to avoid the engagement because you are a holy one. That's what saint means, right? You're a holy one, so live like it. Now, in our culture, we hear people use the word saint, and we usually think of these holy people that have those halos around their heads, but that's not how the New Testament presents it. In fact, I had a friend one time who was a great evangelist, and he would look for any and all opportunities to share the gospel. And he said one time he was traveling with another friend who was a believer, and as they were sitting there, he looked over, and there was a a person in the seat beside them. So the three of them sitting on an airline, him in the middle, his Christian friend, and this other stranger. And he looks over to the stranger here, and he points to his friend. He says, hey, you see my buddy over here? He's a saint. He's a saint. Wow. Wow. The guy responded, I thought you had to be dead to become a saint. (laughs) He got into a conversation with him. He tried to explain to him what saints really are. Ones who have been made holy by God, not by the church, not by tradition, not by some special incantation, but by God. And he starts up this conversation. In fact, he then goes on to say, yeah, you know what? He's not only a saint, but he's also a priest. And at that point, the person in the seat in front of him looks back and says, I don't think he's a saint or a priest. He's got to have one of those collar things for that. But that's not how the New Testament describes us, that we are saints and priests, that we have been called to this high and holy work for God. So why would you go back? Why would you go back to living in a way that is not honoring to God? In fact, he goes beyond just sexual immorality. He even says there should now be no filthiness or foolish talk, no crude joking which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. And he moves from sexual sins of the body to essentially sexual sins of speech. This speech that is usually contaminated with uncleanliness. Filthiness is the word he says. Speaking of ugly sexual behavior as a form of of entertainment. And again, we're in the middle of this in our culture, are we not? There there isn't a movie or TV show that you can turn on today that doesn't have this type of jesting within it. Or, Or this type of foolish talk. You see the word here that's used is where we get the word moron. Don't be a moron when you talk. Don't be one who just chatters and is talkative, who is nonsensical, usually like people who are drunk, people who just go off because they have no control over their mind or their heart or their behavior. In fact, he even tells them to quit crude joking. This idea of being quick-witted and clever that's usually employed in sexually vulgar ways. This beautiful enjoyment of intimacy between a husband and wife is not to be made a joke. And this is hard. This is difficult for us, but this is what we're called to in our walk. He encourages us instead, let there be thanksgiving. The word that we see here is where where we get from the Eucharist or the idea of a thanksgiving unto God. This idea that we direct our thanksgiving to God and our speech should be about God. This is how we walk. This is how we are expected to live. And then Paul gives this very stark statement in verse 5. Read with me what he says. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral 
or impure or who is covetous, that is an idolater, or has, an, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. This is a difficult verse. Because I don't know about you, but if you looked at that list that was just given in the earlier verses about crude talk or sexual behavior, I'm sure many of us, if not all of us in this room, can say we've committed those things. And so we see this passage and we think, well, I've done those things. I've probably done those things as a Christian. Does this then mean I lose my salvation? No, I do not believe that's what Scripture teaches. I believe Scripture teaches that once saved, always saved. No one, including you, will be able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. But this is a warning to somebody. This is a warning to individuals, I believe, who practice unrepentant, idolatrous, sexual impurity. These individuals will not inherit the kingdom of God. This is an individual who says, this is what I want to do, and I don't care if it's right or wrong. It's what I'm going to do. Paul will say many times in his writings, he gives this list of vices in many different contexts. In fact, even the Apostle John will write this. He says that these people will not inherit the kingdom of God, that these people are not children of God. Children of God don't act this way. And this is to be a reminder, a wake-up call. Verse 5 is about what we will not get if we are idolaters. And sure enough, this is the world we live in. We are being deceived. And in fact, Paul says, don't be deceived with empty words because of those things for which the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. He's giving us a warning. Wake up, Christian. When you walk, don't miss the warnings. Have you ever been to an airport before when you're walking down the aisle and you see those golf carts, coming back to golf carts, right, that are transporting people from one end to the other? Have you ever noticed what's on those golf carts? There's usually a big yellow light. There's usually a beeping noise that's emanated from it. And in fact, even the driver himself often has to say, excuse me, pardon me, coming through. I don't know if you've ever done this, but just stop sometime and watch how people react, especially when they have their devices in hand. It's almost like nothing even phases them. And I have seen people literally walk right up to the golf cart and not move. Lights flashing, beeping, people saying, please excuse me, and they bump right into the golf cart. They missed all the warnings. And they blame that guy. The reality is... We live in a culture that's trying to deceive you, especially as it relates to these areas of sexual impurity. Have you ever noticed this? That a lot of the areas in our culture where there is sexual impurity, they've tried to change some of the ways they describe it. For men, if you were to go to certain places that are called gentlemen's clubs, there's nothing gentlemanly about those places. If you've ever turned on a TV show or a movie and it says mature audiences only, no mature individual should watch those shows. If you go into a setting where it says adults only, you can be sure that no good adult who is a son or daughter of God should be in that room. But that's what our culture does. They take sexually immoral things and they twist it in a way to make it look mature or adult, or grown up. Don't be deceived. People with empty words are leading you to the wrath of God. In fact, this is not just in culture. This is even those who, who are within the church. Christians who today are advocating for things that are against the holy standard of God's word. An individual like Rob Bell who says, whether you are gay or straight, it is totally normal and natural and healthy to want to go through life with somebody. It's central to our humanity. We want someone to go on the journey with. Don't be deceived. Encourage people to understand that the wrath of God is coming. This reality of who we are. 
And so sure enough, the encouragement comes to us. And for the sake of time, I'm going to jump down to this last list of things that we are encouraged to do and to don't do. That we are to imitate God. We are his children. We're his sons and his daughters. And he wants us to look like him when we walk like him. We don't want to be sexually immoral. We realize that culture is pushing us to that. But we're children of God. Remember you're his child. Remember your identity that then informs your activity. And not to be greedy and covetousness. It's not becoming of a child of God. But to walk in love. To not speak with crude talk. To remember his love for you. To not be deceived. To be thankful. And to not be partners with evil. This is what we are called in our walk of love. You know, this morning, my, my children, some of my children were still sleeping. And so I decided to come early with my son Elias. And we were walking over to breakfast, had a good breakfast with some saints this morning. And we were walking on our way back here to get ready for the meeting. And as I was walking, I started noticing my son doing something. He started trying to match my steps. Right and left. Not just in how I was stepping, but even the distance between my stepping. He was trying to match how his dad looked in his walk. And in fact, he even said that to me. He said, Dad, do you see what I'm doing? I'm trying to walk like you. This is our calling. To walk like our father. To realize how great a love has been shown upon us. How much more can we walk like him? So brothers and sisters, let's, let's be encouraged this morning. To remember how we should not walk. But to remember to walk in a walk that's worthy. A walk of love. A walk that honors our Father. Dear Father, we come before you this morning. We again thank you for the opportunity to learn how to walk. It seems so simple, yet it takes such time. Devotion to your word, a heart that's committed, and a behavior that's holy. So please help us, Lord. Please help us to understand what it means to walk for your glory. And as a community, as we gather for this conference to be built up and encouraged, help us to remember that when we go back into our lives, our workplace, our school, our neighborhoods, the world is watching. They are watching how we walk. So Lord, help us realize we are to walk in love. Help us to walk for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.